Great, we're here at the uh, B&H studios at NAB 2017, NAB Las Vegas as they call it, as opposed to NAB New York. And the topic is uh, HDR of course, but quality control is the, is the main topic at hand. So we've got a great set of panelists here. I'm going to start at the end and everyone's going to introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Tom Lifko, and I'm the product manager at Bluefish 444. Uh, so Bluefish 444, a SDI video manufacturer. So we can output and input uh, HD SDI, 3G SDI signals um, for capture and output, in this case, for QC. I'm, I'm Joe Byrne. I'm the CTO of Technicolor Postworks in New York. I'm a, a customer of Tom's and also of Gary's. Um, we are a... a, a, a a, a large editorial company and also a uh, fairly large uh, finishing company. Um, and we do uh, HDR and, and 4K workflows and have done so for many, so several years now. Um, and uh, we're not in the QC business per se, but obviously we do QC as part of our pipeline. All right. I'm Gary Mandel. I'm senior product manager at Sony for our professional monitors and uh, large screen devices. Um. I'm Mats Adol, I'm from Assimilate. Uh, we develop a color grading system called Scratch. And as of version 8.6, we've added a whole bunch of HDR features in terms of uh, grading tools, color management, and also uh, QC and metadata uh, delivery. So let's just generally talk about HDR and where we're heading. Certainly HDR is you know, right tied in with UHD or 4K. Uh, there's all the discussion about do we really need it and all that sort of thing. Certainly my opinion is when we're shooting everything we need to be, you know, going uh, full with 4K cameras and doing the full color gamut and everything like that. But where do you think the market's going? What type of um, customers are you coming to you and what percentage do you think you're seeing with regards to HDR productions? Well, um, from our point of view, um, HDR is still at its beginning. Um, but we, we see the, the demand for, for HDR features, for HDR delivery, uh, increasing very fast. Um. We've seen quite a bit of growth on our side uh, with HDR. Uh, in particular, uh, you know, with working with Dolby and also working with the BBC on what the standards were. And then also uh, now, as things are progressing, we're now delivering monitors uh, for production and for QA. And even our TVs now at Sony are uh, displaying uh, both uh, uh, HDR standards. Um, now that the chain is kind of filling up, we see that the, the growth of this is going to be is going to accelerate even more. Mm -hmm. it, it's hard to come up with a percentage, but I would say that the um, virtually every scripted dramatic program that we do for television and virtually every feature has an HDR plan, if not executed in the first round of, of post, um, it's, it's definitely accounted for. We account for an HDR workflow now in every show in terms of the way that we archive and the way that we do the um, assembly. Uh, so we're ready to do HDR, properly ready with the right content for every program. And what I say to my customers who are not electing to do HDR now is that if you don't do HDR yourself, somebody may do it for you. So we, it's <laughs> that, that's of a, a really good point. Thing yeah, in, we in ran the, into that with color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so we're we're urging people if they have the means to do it. But we at least uh, we at least bank it, um, and so you can come back and you have sufficient bit depth and uh, insufficient um, uh, uh, information in the in the in the content that is common to both the SDR and the HDR delivery. Yeah. So Stan, I think you touched on it before that the. Um, UHD has been around for quite some time now. Uh, that's been adopted by our customers and supported by Bluefish um, for a good few years. And in, in recent years, uh, we've seen HDR basically uh, catch up with that. And so now people are really demanding HDR workflows in addition to UHD. And I think the two do have to go together. Um, there, is, there is the possibility to do HDR in, in 2K. Um, but I think the two just really work very well together. You've got to have the resolution um, as well as the uh, color. It was almost like 4K was in a way kind of done compulsively because we could, you know, because it was there. And HDR is a little different. HDR, it gets the audience excited. And 
you know, not to say that there aren't programs that are amazing in 4K and where you have the, the content where you really need that resolution. But there's a good argument to say that at 24 frames a second, 4K kind of doesn't even really exist. You know, and it's more, you know, it's there in the still image, but it's not there in every, you know, it's not, the, 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 we don't quite resolve that much information in 4K, but HDR makes 4K work. Yep. And oh. it, it, it also, it, it's a significant improvement in apparent, apparent resolution because the high frequency detail is more, the high frequency contrast is more visible. Now, we didn't really talk about the color aspect though. I yeah. mean, HDR isn't just, uh, you know, dynamic range. No. So what about switching into 2020, 2020 and how do you manage that? Well, you must get material in from all sorts of sources. And how do you match it? How do you make sure they've shot them in the right environment? Oh, well, I don't want to monopolize things, but they... Um, now, go ahead. It's, the Technicolor operation, the larger Technicolor operation, which we're a small part and kind of a cousin, um, has um, world-class uh, uh, color science as part of its DNA. And obviously the origin of the company in 1915, it was a, it's a color company. So it's, um, we are privileged to be able to work with people who are very good at helping us put that together. And we have our own group in New York that um, is able to manage that stuff. And we do a lot of custom lots and things like that. But increasingly, the, uh, the products that we use um, were uh, uh, the, both the device and also the, um, uh, the ecosystem. For instance, the Sony ecosystem is one that end to end, they have a good story about how you get from the lens to the, to the screen. Um, and every part of it, and that's uh, that's a very positive thing about working about Sony. Obviously, every show that we do is heterogeneous in many, many ways, and uh, we deliver sh shows to the so to the Sony studios that are shot on other cameras, and we have lots of other things too. So there's a there's a there's quite a lot of um, there's a lot, kind of quite a lot of um, uh, variation. But the truth is that if you're working to a higher, more uh, inclusive um, co uh, color space, color space, and tonal space. Um, uh, y it is easier to do a good job if you uh, if you know what you're doing. You you get yourself in less trouble by maintaining a large color volume, for instance. Um, then and the, the, if you are able to incorporate, for instance, uh, 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 more of the scene information, um, you and you, it's, it's less lossy. Uh, that in general tends to be more conservative, and that's a positive. Now, how do you handle color volume? <laughs> um, actually, I want to pick up on uh, what Joe said about HDR makes 4K work. Um, and that's actually, that's actually quite true, because HDR, um, the purpose of HDR is to, to make the image more real, um, and that doesn't only work with high dynamic range, but you also want to have a higher resolution, you want to have a higher gamut, you want to um, you want to have more colors, more color fidelity, um, and that's where uh, uh, those color spaces P3 and Rec 2020 come into play, uh, that are um, simply able to display what's out there, more like it actually is, and you won't be limited by uh, the smaller uh, color spaces that we've been dealing with up until now. Yeah, I think that's actually a very good point because uh, up until very recently when the HDR standards and the color space was expanded, uh, essentially uh, ever, everyone's been limited to a, a very narrow kind of space for legacy reasons, essentially. Uh, there's no need to do that. A lot of the displays are, are more capable than that and have been for a, a while, um, but that's just been limited due to the standard and it not being revised for a very long time. So this, I think, is a very well overdue um, upgrade to the color space and the, the dynamic range that we now can actually play with and display. Now, the, you know, the topic is mainly quality and how do we handle that? How do we make sure people are getting through the whole chain what you expect to see in HDR? Well, in the monitoring side, um, it gets, you know, pretty, pretty specific. Um, what, one thing that I, I think that needs to be very clear is that um, there is some confusion between a, a monitoring as a bright display and monitoring as a high dynamic display. 
Um, and the, you need to understand when we're talking about HDR, it's high dynamic range. It's not high brightness. And I think, you know, Joe, I think you could probably see you're doing the same thing. When HDR first came out, we had the extra brightness in the displays, and people were authoring content using that, and you would see the levels of that content come up. Now we're seeing that people are bringing it back down, and that the average level seems to be about the same as where we were with SDR, but they're taking advantage of these higher ranges to uh, uh, enhance that image. So what happens now is there are some assumptions that even though you have a limited dynamic range display that is high brightness, that you're going to get the same results as actually having a real uh, HDR display. And that starts getting to be critical in your monitoring. So you need to have a good monitor. You need something, you need a high dynamic range monitor, not a high brightness monitor. Mm -hmm. And it needs to show you the whites and the highlights and the speculars, but it also has to show you the details and the blacks. If you don't have that, you're really just in standard dynamic range with a bright display. And there needs to be an understanding that bright is not HDR. Range is HDR. So when you're looking at your monitoring, it has to use that. That's, your, that's the key point of that display. Now, when you look at, you talk about brightness, and obviously we, we dive into nits at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is you don't need a high brightness set. You need a high dynamic range set. Right. Now, that range of that, normally, it's easier to make it brighter than it is to make it darker. Technologies that make it brighter tend to be the LCD technologies. But again, you're limited. LCD, since it's a transmissive system, only has a certain dynamic range. So what, hap what you find is they'll make it brighter, and typically with some of these daylight displays, but the range, the blacks, also elevate at the same time. With OLED, it's much easier to do. Since OLED is an emissive display, and you can essentially turn the pixel off, you can keep that range. And that becomes a very critical part of this. I guess from the, the QA part on the, on the whole chain is ultimately, well, just an example, when you, when you master something, how many versions do you need to do? <laughs> it's almost like, what aren't we making rather than what we are making? Um, so we, we had a hand in doing a lot of Stereo 3D, and everybody has kind of Stereo 3D fatigue. Uh -oh, now so you're swearing. I'm not, not going <laughs> to go into that. But, and one nice thing about HDR, and this goes to what Gary was talking about, about particularly about the, um, the lower end of the, of the tonal scale, is the... Um, uh, one thing about HDR is that some of the things that we, that as a, as a um, cinematic uh, um, audience enjoys about stereo 3D, obviously, is the sense of volume and realness and the plasticity of the image. And HDR, to, to a degree, gives you something of that same quality. And, um, and it does it in a way that is less compromised by eyewear and, and the tilt of your head and the you know, screen you know, uh, the um, hot, po hot spots in the screen and things like that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a more robust, a uh, little bit more um, uh, uh, forgiving um, uh, uh, medium. And that's, it's been interesting to compare the two. There, I think there are a lot of meaningful lessons that we learned from Stereo 3D that we're bringing to high dynamic range and wide color gamut as well. Because um, we get them both at the same time. The technology is funny, you know, you, don't, you, the, you go through these kind of uh, epics in technology where you go from like one epic to the other epic and at the boundary there's a lot of damage but as you get into the next epic you get a bunch of different things it's not usually just one thing that you're getting you get so at the when we went from standard dynamic range to, to HD to HD we also got widescreen and we also got progressive uh, displays and we also got digital and it was all at one time, you know, roughly one time. And that was, you know, so that we had this big platform thing. We took a big step up. And there were now, a lot now of things. don't forget about sound. And, and yes, <laughs> yeah, multi-channel multi -channel sound. And n now we're going kind of through a similar thing. We're getting wide color gamut. We're getting high dynamic range. We're getting, obviously, much uh, greater resolution. We're getting higher color precision. We're getting, uh, you know, all of these things at the same time, object-based audio and immersive audio. And all of that's coming at the same time, and you get all the benefits at the same time. But you have to, you have to work in realistically in this new ecosystem that and bring all these things up together. The whole table has to be lifted. You can't just li lift up one leg. So you've got to account for all these things accurately. And the thing that we've been kind of waiting for, and honestly, we didn't even really have after the death of the CRT, 
was a reference display that we really trusted. We had you know, a kind of compromise thing that we all lived with for a while, but, but now we have something. Uh, we, so we, we have, I mean, I'm thinking of one in particular. I'm not flattering Gary, but we use one of, of Sony's displays as our kind of god reference for everything. And um, we use it for SDR and HDR, and there, there are merits to doing that as well. And for one thing, you have one display in the room, which I was always told, told in the early days of when I was building facilities, that the last thing in the world, the old guys used to say to me, do not put more than one color dis uh, monitor in a room. <laughs> if you're <laughs> doing right. so, you're taking your life in your hands. And you're certainly going to shorten your life uh, if, if you do that. And of course, we're doing that now, now all the time for a variety of reasons that are not ideal, but we have to do that. And having, having as, at, least, at least for the mastering display, the thing that the colorist is looking at or the, the uh, cinematographer is looking at, having that be a 100% reliable display within the limits of the physics is, um, is, is absolutely key. And that's the number one uh, QC tool we use is the human eye and, the, and that, dis that, that display. I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> well, so well, I think that, yeah, go ahead. That, that was quite important. So I think everyone's uh, looking at the displays, which is obviously a, a very important aspect of that. But then you've also got to remember the, the, the packaging side. Yeah. So yeah, once absolutely. once your content's finished, that'll get wrapped up in uh, various different formats at the moment, I suspect. But yeah. um, that'll get packaged in, say, an IMF or something similar. Right. Um, so that that package itself needs to be QC'd. That's not necessarily something that Bluefish are involved in, but the package itself has to be compliant. Um, then there's also the actual the video and the audio content has to be QC. So that's where the display and, and Bluefish as well, and also the software comes into play. So we have many customers um, developing solutions for, for exactly this, to, to be able to QC the package itself, make sure that's compliant with the standards that are available today, and also then to replay those and push them across uh, SDI interfaces to the reference display. So I think that's another important aspect. There's, there's multiple kind of steps in the QC process. It's not just the, the actual visual of it. There's yeah. the delivery as well. The way that I ran into Tom's group is we were looking for a 12-bit player in a reliable player that was 12 bits at the interface. We're, our workflows are mostly 16-bit float, but, they, but we needed something that was reliably presenting 12 bits to the, to the displays. And that's both in the digital cinema side of our business and, and television. And uh, so we, that's, that has proved to be so, you know, something unusual. And you guys have a little bit of a, of, a, uh, of a lead in that area and looking for a reliable player. And one of the things that we lost when tape went away was tape had affordances that were unique and that we'd come to rely on. And you hit play, and it played. You know, it played at the f frame rate. You didn't have to like watch the deck and see if you're like dropping frames. Yeah, that's it right. It just played. And the the it was the format. Yeah. You didn't have to check that it was in the right format right. because it was the. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now it's a file format. It can be so any number of things. Anything, <laughs> anything you want, kind of. So, yeah. And I mean that's good, you know, because we have. Uh, we're able to deliver very flexibly to the customer who it needs a, a great variety of things, and we can make the Latvian language version of a show that we never something we could never do before. Yeah, and that's, that's we can do that with a feature film, so that's amazing. But with great complexity comes great responsibility, and and you and when that's happening in the middle of the night, right before you're going to air, and you need to be able to 100% reliably hit that button and get something that actually plays. That's that's a something. We, so that's a, that's another thing. We need a reference player, is the other basic, you know, the, the starting block kind of uh, kind of device. So let's continue on the IMF side just for a minute. So certainly IMF is no question ideal for versioning and sending out hundreds of different profiles and you name it. And of course, one of the big advantages of IMF is when you need to change the graphic, for instance, to be in another language, you can, you can throw up a clip with that. Now, how will that work where do you need to have an SDR version and an HDR version? Do you move it later? Do you automate that? Um, you can automate it. Um, so the way Scratch works is it has a, a node output structure. So let's assume you have your main timeline and you have created it in HDR. Uh, you can simply create a version of that, a derivative in SDR, and put a grade all over the whole timeline. Now, this is 
more or less the, the quick and dirty way to do it. Uh, obviously, you can also create a version of the timeline itself and now touch each clip separately and create an SDR version from that and the corresponding output format, be it ProRes, be it uh, an OpenXR sequence, uh, and deliver that for the packaging along with the corresponding metadata um, that you want to generate. Sounds complex. <laughs> it sounds complex, but uh, the, actual, the actual operating of it is, is quite simple and straightforward. So it's no different than what you used to do with, with uh, color correction. Well, um, except you obviously you have more more knobs. <laughs> <laughs> Quite, um, as, as Joe said, the the main QC tool is the human eye. So, um, grading HDR is is uh, is different from grading SDR, uh, especially when you when you need to decide how you treat your specular highlights, how you treat the the average light level of your picture, um, and to be able to judge this correctly, you need to have uh, uh, at least a 10-bit pipeline uh, to a reference screen. You want to kick in? That's, yeah, that is where Bluefish come into play. So with things like Simulate Scratch and, and other applications that we support for QC and for all types of content creation, we're able to uh, take the frames from the relevant application like Scratch uh, and then process those on the card and push them down uh, pr at the moment, probably pr predominantly quad-link 3G SDI, I'd say. Um, but of course, there are emerging standards. Uh, this is actually one of our prototype cards of a forthcoming product, and it will have other interfaces. So that's, that's an emerging technology um, that, that we'll, be, we'll be covering. Is 12 bits enough? Or <laughs> um, too much? Yeah. Spencer, and if you're I listening to those high frame rate guys, that's one of the things that we didn't touch on is that you can also go faster. And in some ways you should, like I was referring to before, the, 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 you, know, you can make the argument that we're not really fixing motion very well at 24 and 30 and 25. Um, we should go to s minimum 50 and 60 and then maybe higher in order to get certain kinds of things. You know, there's a, um, there's a, there's a compelling argument that you'll, that you'll do that. And for certain kinds of content, you absolutely need to do it. Um, you know, famously, if you shoot a soccer match, you can't see the ball at 24. It disappears, and that's not, that's not exactly compelling filmmaking. So there's a, you know, we will find that we need faster and bigger and, you know, more powerful, uh, more robust systems to handle all this stuff. Um, you know, we've been doing lots of different versions for a long time. You know, you think about it, we're doing the airline version and the, the you know, the, the original, uh, the original aspect ratio version and the 16 by 9 version, things like that. And in stereo 3D, again, not to bring that up again, but we were doing four <laughs> different light levels. We did Hugo and we, we actually had grading in the room. We had four uh, digital cinema projectors that we were using to simultaneously basically grade all the different light levels. So including the 2D version. And because you couldn't quite fit all of those into the rig that produced the Dolby version and the Real D version and the 15-foot Lambert or 14-foot Lambert um, uh, uh, a stereo version, um, which I'm not sure we did. And, and that you know we've been used to that for a while. H HDR also comes in several flavors. So we have to account for the market there too, and that's that's not getting any simpler. It's getting you know it's it's diverging. It's almost like we're s we're expanding spherically from a single point rather than the road widening. It's kind of like we're in the inside of a balloon and we're watching every part of the balloon kind of a blowing away, like the Big Bang away from us, and that's why all this stuff is happening. And in a certain way, it's good. It's because we're serving more audiences. We're giving people uh, greater, diff you know, if you can now watch it on your iPhone, and it, that's a kind of satisfying experience in a certain way. And there's, there's HDR on, on, on devices now. All right, so let's get down to the meat. What about the financial implications oh of this? Here we go, that's right. I mean, you've got a card there, works great. You need more storage. That's quite right. Um, so I think a, a lot of that comes with the UHD upgrade, though, mm -hmm. as well. Um, as far as HDR, SDR, uh, that, would, that would be the processing required there would be coming down to the, the graphics systems um, that are required for, uh, for image processing, uh, not so much the, um, the storage around it or, the, or even the uh, interface card. So 
us supporting 10-bit uh, and 12-bit SDI and uh, Quadlink 3G actually does cover um, most of the workflows today for um, HDR content creation. So the, the cards that we've been using for, we've been selling for um, five or six years now actually do support HDR workflows. So that's not the HDR aspect of that is not actually necessarily part of the reason to upgrade. Uh, 4K and, as Joe said before, high frame rate is, is where it really gets uh, interesting. Uh, 60 frames and potentially beyond uh, becomes very, very tricky. What will you handle? How high can you go? Uh, so within the SDI framework, um, Standards, I believe, only go up to 60 frames per second. Uh, there are ways to get 120 frames per second, but it's not necessarily a, an industry standard. Uh, so we can do that. It's essentially octal links. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, on on this board, the forthcoming Kronos board, we'll be able to uh, achieve 4K 120 frames per second, um, given the devices receiving it can understand that signal. Right. <laughs> As far as the monitors go right now, we're not there at 120. Um, but we can do the 60. So yeah. for your applications, that 60 is a pretty generic, you know, usable format. As you start going to 120, yeah, now we're, now we're getting it. We want to do 4K. Now we want to do HDR. Now we want to do 12-bit. Now we want to do it at 444. Now we, you, know, <laughs> you can drive this completely out of any reasonable price range. But if you keep it within, you know, 60 hertz, uh, both formats, HDR formats, have shown uh, great performance, uh, Adobe and the PQ at 10 bits. Um, you keep it to color spaces, you know, maybe you could keep it to P3 or maybe P3 mapped within 2020, something like that. The costs come down. It gets much easier to do. So you don't really have to be totally, totally high end. No, no. If you really so look is, at this, is this moving to the point yet where the general person that's moved in and say, you know, I want to shoot 4K because I've got more pixels so I can fix it in post excuse or reason, which is really good. I think that's the best way to go. But is it getting to that point where they'll be able to produce some HDR, wider color gamut? I can't speak to the workflow of it. On the display side, it's still pricey. Um, in order to do it correctly, in order to keep it accurate, there are some things we have to do in the display that keeps the cost up. Um, but that's going to change. I think already you're starting to see on the consumer side that the TVs are adopting it. And while that's not a monitor, the cost is coming down. On the cameras, you're seeing the cameras now all the way down to the, even the couple thousand dollar cameras are able to uh, record HDR. Absolutely. Yeah. So to bring it into a low-cost application is not that difficult now. Um, you're going to make some sacrifices, uh, and you're probably going to have some problems. It's not, not going to be... But you probably don't have to do 120. You probably don't have to. I, yeah, I, yeah. Th I think 120... I, I don't know how you <laughs> feel. I think 120 is... We're not there yet. Yeah, that's not pushing it. So in, in your environment, is, the, is stretch real-time? Absolutely. I mean, we've been it's talking... All right, so stop there for a second. Real time at 60 hertz. Yes, absolutely. And not 120, or is it real time at 120? We, we could do 120. That wouldn't be an issue, given that the, the hardware requirements are met. I mean, you, right. you need a storage that, that can provide the data in real time, which is a whole different story in 120 hertz 4K than it is with six... Uh, 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 that is with 60 FPS. Mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, with HDR, you you want to stay at least at 10-bit or 12-bit. So that already adds to, to the data rate that the storage needs to provide. And obviously, every, every other um, bit of hardware in the chain, like your GPU or the CPU for the decoding, GPU sending the image back to the SDI video I.O. from the Bluefish guys, etc. So um, you need to ensure that the whole hardware chain meets the requirement. If, if that's the case, uh, we can certainly do uh, 120 FPS in Scratch, um, and uh, yeah. So let's just talk about the different types of technology you, you may need if you're doing a TV program or a theatrical or movies or whatever. Where does that fit in? Uh, sorry, can you it, it, The different technologies needed. Can you use one for everything? 
How do you see that on the Technicolor side? Yeah, true. Are people really shooting for one environment? Because when I look at, you know, people normally decide I'm going to shoot in this format because it's a theatrical thing and I yeah. want to move on. And, and then later, when it comes to versioning, they go, oh, somebody's just watching it on their phone. Yeah. Why did I go through all that? Yeah, there's a, an implied hierarchy. If it's not explicit, it's kind of, um, it's de facto hierarchy. I think we were spoiled in a funny, you know, in, a, in the early or, you know, what sounds like a long time ago in the 20th century. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, it, when we, when the master format for acquisition and the premium format for this, for exhibition, were both 35 millimeter film, you know, or po you know, possibly 65, 70. That was easier to, it was easier to follow the relationship between the best possible qu quality and the product that you made because of the constraints of the system you were delivering into. So digi digital formats afford that same kind of hierarchy, but it's more subtle and it's more com complicated. Significantly more complicated. So in acquisition, we're, you know, we've always shot HDR in acquisition, even on film. And you know, bro broadcast television was not an HDR format. But um, but since we've gone to di digital cin cinematographic cameras, and it's now pretty common. And we even have we have reali reality TV shows that um, shoot in log and actually um, produce beautiful looking imagery. Um, and it's relatively easy to do that. And the truth is now with your iPhone, you actually shoot. It's, it's a better HD camera than an H, any HD camera you could buy in the world in 1990, with all due respect. Uh, you know, it was, it was amazing. And the HDR quality of it is actually pretty well, good. Well, let's not talk about the compression Kodak in okay, it. Okay, yeah, this, you, know, you don't look too closely. But uh, with my prescription, it, it looks pretty good. But the, you know, the truth is now we're, we're in a situation where we're, we're producing content that is appropriate to the to the um, to the context in which it's which it's consumed um, we still have to plan for and aim for the highest possible quality that we can afford and sometimes you can't afford to do that but we strongly urge every client well, you're, you're to looking make at everything on the high end though there are people no, that I, just want to produce an HDR thing and that's it yeah, you, you can do that. And, and like I was saying before, if you're doing that, you're It's short-lived. It's short-lived. I can sure. make a lot of money doing it and yeah. go for well, it. A nice thing about hybrid log gamma, which is one of the formats that, we, um, that is out there in, in, the, uh, in the world now, is that um, that format is a kind of a, a live-friendly format. And it's a very much a, it's, it, it's, it, it, it accommodates a lot of different things in the broadcast workflow. So, um, and you know, we, and we, we talk, uh, you know, Technicolor also has a horse in the uh, HDR race. So we, we talk to broadcasters all the time about, uh, about accommodating HDR in their workflows. And that's literally everything. And talking about, you know, soap operas um, and news and sports and everything else. Um, and it's, you know, multi-camera comedy and things like that. And there's no reason, it, a lot of that stuff benefits very greatly from HDR. Um, it's funny, you know, there's a sense of realism that HDR brings, even if it's not the fireworks spectacular stuff. Even just the, you know, we, we were working on a, a project for a, a network I, I can't talk about, but the, the, um, it was a sh it's a show that's set in the 1970s. And I was a young guy in the 1970s. And there's a character in the show who is a kind of disreputable guy. And his clothes are in very bad taste. And I recognized the coat that he was wearing because I owned that coat in 1975. And I could see it. And I, I had seen the SDR dailies on the show and I didn't notice. Well, you know, maybe you gave that coat real. away to charity. Yeah, well, I hope so, yeah. <laughs> maybe it might have been my coat. But that's, I could tell because I could tell what kind of fabric it was made in HDR. And I had not seen that in the dailies. And I looked at the dailies pretty closely. So that's sort of touching on uh, what you were saying before, Gary, about the, the low lights, I presume, of being yeah. able to yeah. see in the detail in Very the darker much. scenes. It's not, not just about making it really bright, it's the highlights yeah. and also the detail in the blacks. So you can see that kind of thing. Yeah, right. so 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 not every HDR yeah. pro project is you know, revenant. You know, some of them are things that are more modest th and, the, and the, some of the benefit of HDR is redounds more gra you know, in a greater way, easy, more easily to projects when you're just turning the camera on. You know, and that's it, the magic in a funny way is 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 there right away. So let's get into the cycle visual side of this. 
you brought up the dirty word 3D. Yeah. Uh, you know, people didn't realize that, you know, they were making all the kids 3D movies for adults because their, their pupil distances yeah. were incorrect, so all the kids were screaming initially. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you, when you switch from a dark screen to a bright screen on a, on a high-knit, uh, you know, set, uh, you know, you're reaching for your sunglasses. Yeah. Where, where, where's the quality control on that? How do, you, how do you manage that? Do you adjust the set so that it comes up slowly, or does it just kill the power supply in it and go for it, or? You, you might have to do that on the TV. Um, hopefully, the one authors that kind of content and put some limitations on it. On the monitor side, we don't want to have any kind of limitation like that, because then you don't really know what you're making. So you're not going to see that kind of thing. Of course. Um, and if you look at it on, on the monitor, you know, in a, mon in a real HDR monitor, um, you can see when it starts getting uncomfortable. I, I think the colorists are pretty in tune to that. Yeah. But even more important to that, I think, is when you're working in HDR, I think you have to look at it a little bit. The creatives have to take a different look at how that works. Because now you can take parts of the picture and you can add accents to it that you couldn't do before. And one of the issues I saw one time uh, was a shot in a studio on, on a stage. And there was a window. And the window was lit behind. And at a certain scene when they did a certain pan, uh, you could look out the window and you saw all the detail in the back. Well, it took you completely away from the story and the actor, and it just drew you. Hey, look out the window, you know, and you lost, you know, you lost all that. So, some of the content. You're using the same excuse with VR now. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm looking in the wrong place. <laughs> okay, but it is something. I, I also heard a story about uh, a woman who had jewelry on her, uh, was wearing some jewelry, some diamonds or something, and when they were setting up and getting ready, uh, she was facing forward and everything was fine. But as soon as she turned, a specular came off of the jewelry and yeah. it just became so... I guess the question is, will we get over that? Because when we started shooting, in a, uh, when we started delivering, rather, uh, sitcoms in HDR, they were obviously shot in film a lot, uh, people started reading the little sticky notes on the fridge and things like mm -hmm. that where before they couldn't see that. So, mm -hmm. But now they just get over it. The yeah. content's gone. So uh, with regards to automated uh, conversion then from HDR to SDR, uh, on, a, on a total scale, just throw it in, let it do it. Does it work? You mean the automated uh, conversion? Yeah. Well, as always, it depends on the content, obviously. Um, you need to decide whether, uh, whether an automated uh, uh, version from an SDR grade down to an SDR grade would still work. Um, usually, usually I'm all for, you know, doing a proper versioning and really go through an SDR grading session from your HDR content. So with that, I think we're pretty much finished, and uh, we'll thank our panel here. Thank you. That's good. Thank you.